a lot of time this morning, so I'm going to jump right in. I want to take you on a bit of a journey with me that should be on the screen uh, in a second. So a few months ago, I found myself helicoptering into the height of the Himalayas and to remote regions deep in those mountains where we would spend uh, many days hiking through those villages. Um, and I try to travel overseas three or four times a year as a pastor, but these mountains for me represent the clearest, most urgent collision of spiritual need and physical need. So urgent spiritual need, urgent physical need. I'll give you a picture of the physical. Um, they did some research years ago and they found that about half of the children in these villages were dying before their eighth birthday. So I have, I have four children in my home right now, one who we're in the process of adopting from China. One of my biggest fears is something happening to one of them. Like I can imagine that being an expectation for half of them. And they're dying of things like preventable diseases. They, yeah, they don't have clean water. They have an infection that I could go, you could go and get over-the-counter the, over medicine for on a cut. But without that, infection deepens, takes over their entire body. One of the worst byproducts of the poverty in these villages is trafficking. So you'll go through some of these villages and you'll hardly see girls much older than this. So if you just kind of picture the way it plays out, a trafficker will come through, see a family struggling to provide for their daughter who may or may not be able to live. And so they say to her, to the parents, hey, we'll take your daughter down into the city. We'll get her a, a good job, good education, where she can be supported and be healthy, even be able to start making money where she can send that back up to help you and your family. We'll take really good care of her. And they give the equivalent of about $100 as a pledge. It says, We'll, we'll pledge this and then she'll be able to come back up and visit at different times and bring things to you to support you and your other kids. That whole talk is fairly persuasive for a family in poverty. And so they send their daughters down, sometimes as young as eight years old, 10, 12, down to the city where they will not get a good job. They will be put into a brothel where they will be broken and abused, drugged, raped, and then put to work with whatever the men who come in there want to do with them. And they will never, ever go back home. They'll either stay there in the city or be taken across the borders into other areas. So urgent physical need. On top of urgent spiritual need. So these mountains are the birthplace of Hinduism and Buddhism. And the gospel has, in most of these villages, never even gone there. I've mentioned a couple times yesterday, these are, these are situations where when you meet somebody on a trail and you say, what do you know about Jesus? Their response is, Who's that? I've never even heard his name. So in 2,000 years, the gospel has not even gone there. I shared last night at an event in this room about watching bodies burn on funeral pyres. This is uh, one particular setting where yeah, they bring a body and set it ablaze 
And they believe that as the ashes go down into this river beneath this funeral pyre that this will help them in the process of reincarnation. It's a sober scene. And so in the few minutes I have with you this morning, I just want to plead with you in view of a world of urgent spiritual and physical need to refuse to settle for living a nice, comfortable Christian spin on the American dream in your life. I want to plead with you based upon God's word in light of a world of urgent need, I want to plead with you to make your life count for the spread of God's grace and God's love and God's goodness and God's mercy and God's justice and God's glory in a world of urgent need. So I, I had actually originally planned to be in another text this morning, but as I was praying for you this morning, even just spending time yesterday, this is my first time at Viola. I've heard so many good things about Viola, and I've been so encouraged just being on this campus. I see so many evidences of God's grace here. I trust you know there's so many evidences of God's grace. But as I was praying for you this morning, I was just praying, God, cause your grace on this campus to resound to your glory in a world of urgent need. I raise up students who are zealous to make their lives count for your glory in a world of urgent need. And I was just provoked to pray based on one passage of scripture that I want to I take us to. So if you have a Bible, and I hope you or somebody around you does that you can look on with, I would invite you to open with me to Luke chapter nine. Luke chapter nine, and I just want to share with you the three ways I was provoked this morning to pray for you on this campus. And they're straight from Luke chapter nine, verse 57 through 62. So, I mean, let me read the passage, and then I'm just gonna, I just wanna share with you the three ways I am praying for you, and I hope that in, in sharing these with you, you would be encouraged in these three ways. So, here's, here's what God's word says. Luke 9, verse 57. As they were walking along the road, someone said to him, and him is Jesus in this story. Someone said to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. To another, he said, follow me. But he said, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Yet another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first, let me say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. So three interactions with three men that introduce us to what it means to follow Jesus. Like this is it's a very different definition than what we sometimes give for what it means to follow Jesus. This is not admit, admit, believe, confess, pray the prayer, and you're in. Like, this is much more involved than that. So, so here's the three ways I'm compelled to pray for you based on these three interactions between these men and Jesus. So one, I pray that Jesus will be enough for you. I pray that Jesus will be enough for you. This first guy says to Jesus, I'll follow you wherever you go. Now we know from uh, Mark's version of this story, Mark 8, that uh, uh, this was likely a, a religious teacher and it was common in that day for uh, religious teachers to kind of attach themselves to a higher teacher or to one with more standing, more crowds even, and that would kind of help them advance their own standing. 
So it's likely this guy is trying to, sees Jesus is very popular, has all kinds of crowds around him, so he's kind of trying to get in, and Jesus is kind of a means for him to kind of climb the ladder, so to speak, among the religious teachers. So Jesus pulls this guy aside. I can almost picture him just kind of putting his hand on his shoulder and saying, uh, I want you to look down this road I'm headed on. I want you to look uh, past all these crowds that are following me right now. Look past all those crowds one day that will wave palm branches before me. Look past all this, and uh, there's a cross at the end of this road. And by the way, uh, there are no uh, holiday inns between here and there. Like, I don't even have a place to lay my head. In other words, if you follow me, I'm all you've got. If you follow me, I'm all you've got. You're not even guaranteed a roof over your head. Jesus is making clear to this man, he is not a means to an end. He is the end. I want you to think about how significant this is. I, I, as I travel around the world, I see the rampant spread of what's called the prosperity gospel. It says, uh, it's all over our country, it's all over Latin America, it's all over Africa, different parts of Asia, like, come to Jesus and you will get good health. Come to Jesus, you will have wealth. Come to Jesus, you will have prosperity. You will have success. You will have comfort in this world. Come to Jesus and you'll get these things. And it's not the gospel. We don't come to Jesus to get health, wealth, prosperity, comfort, success. We come to Jesus to get Jesus. <laughs> He's the one we want. He's the one we need. And the picture here is this man needs to realize in a way I pray that we will all realize that he is enough. That he is, there's a security that's found in him that's not found in having a shelter over your head. There's a joy that's found in him that all the possessions of this world cannot compare with. So what I'm pleading for you, and even my own life, as I pray the same things for my own life, is that we would see Jesus as enough for us. That we would not see Jesus as a means to all these other things in this world. He's better than all the best things this world has to offer us. That that would be true in our lives, in our community together, in churches. Like I think about being in the Himalayas. So it was days before we got to a place where we actually met believers. And there was just one night, uh, we, had, we had hiked up this really high mountain. And it was, it was a tough hike. And I mean, guys are struggling. And uh, I mean, other guys, you know, not me. Uh, but okay, I was struggling. So you just kind of take 10 steps and pause to observe the beauty and pray and sit. And then 10 more steps. Like it was, it was just a grueling hike. So we get to the top there. And uh, when we get there, we find out that there is a little church that's meeting that night. And I'm thinking, these guys must be the most stout followers of Christ in the world because they come up here for church. And so uh, I'm thinking all these guys do CrossFit. And uh, so I, it gets dark and we start seeing these tiny little lights uh, coming up the trails, coming up the mountain, just a few here, a few there. And I'm thinking these guys have got to be just stout and they get up there like it's, it's older women with little children on their backs. And they, they've hiked up there where they gather in this little room, like just cram in, there's probably 20, 30 crammed into this little room, one little light bulb hanging in the middle, we're like practically sitting on top of each other. And for a few hours, they sing, they pray, they we read the word, we encourage one another with the word. They're talking about how they're facing persecution in different ways. They're talking about how they can help one another amidst persecution. They're talking about how they want to share the gospel with this person or that person that's persecuting them. It's just pure church. So I, I, I look at this setting and 
I think they have so, they have so little in this church. I mean, it's so simple. And we might be tempted to think, well, what can we do? Like, can we send some resources over there to help them? And this is where I just want to encourage us. Like the Holy Spirit is doing just fine in that group of people without all the resources we surround ourselves with in the church. Like apparently the word of God and the spirit of God are enough to be the church. And I just want to encourage us, like, is, is that enough for us? Or do we need bells and whistles? Do we need all the stuff that we fill our church culture with? Is Jesus enough for us? Is his word enough for us? Like it reminds me of times where I've been in uh, uh, underground house church locations in another part of Asia where I remember the first time I ever met with this small group of church leaders. Now this is a country where it's illegal to gather together as followers of Christ. And uh, they they'd heard that I'd I had taught at a seminary in the past, I was a pastor, and so they said, hey, can you come meet with some of our leaders? So they, they told me to put a dark jacket on and dark pants with a hood over it, and they sneak me into this place where we meet in this secret location. I thought we'd be doing like a Bible study for an hour or so, and we start diving in the Word, and eight hours later, we're still going strong. And they're like, we want to do this again tomorrow. I was like, okay, like, Maybe tomorrow night. And they're like, no, tomorrow morning. It's like, okay, early, early morning Bible study. They said, well, early morning until tomorrow night. It's like, okay. So the next day we get together. That, was, that started a week and a half, 12 hours a day. Just sitting down with them in these underground locations with the word. They're just eating it up. I remember early on I was walking through the book of Nehemiah. I was showing them background history of the book of Nehemiah, uh, the importance of God's word in the middle of God's people. They came up to me afterwards like when we were taking a break and they said, we've never heard all that about Nehemiah. Can you do that for us with all the books of the Old Testament? <laughs> it's like, that'll take a long time. They're like, we, we want to know God's word. It's like, okay. So we just start walking through uh, and they're wanting to ask all kinds of questions. Like we get the Song of Solomon, it was a little crazy. But anyway, <laughs> like, but they're just hungry. They're eating it all up. I remember we for so for ten days, pretty much, we walked through the Old Testament. We finally finished Malachi. We had one day left, and I'm like, okay. They're like, we want to go full twelve hours. I'm like, okay. Uh, so the next morning, I don't, I don't remember where I started. I started something else, and uh, um, somebody in the back raised their hand. They said, uh, we have a problem, teacher. I was like, what's the problem? He said, you've taught us the whole Old Testament, but you've not taught us the New Testament. And they said, we would like the New Testament today. Uh, so it's like, okay. So there's 12 hours. We just walked from Matthew to Revelation. They love this word. They love it. Like, it's the word of Jesus. They love it. They, it it's worth their lives to know it. Like, is this the way you feel about his word? Is his word enough for you? Is it better to you? And anything else you, you have or can go to in this world, like you live on this word. That's what I mean. I pray that Jesus will be enough for you. That his word, his spirit, relationship with him, intimacy with him. And you'll be like, Jesus, you're the end in my life. I gotta move on. Second, second. I pray that the proclamation of Jesus' kingdom will be the priority in all your plans and dreams. I pray that the proclamation of Jesus' kingdom will be the priority in all your plans and dreams. This second guy, Jesus says, follow me. He says, uh, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Some, some scholars kind of disagree over whether or not this guy's dad had actually died yet or not. Maybe he was about to die or he had just died. So either way though, think about it. This man, his dad has just died. So of course he wants to go back, give his father a proper burial, which is something he would want to do and something he would be expected to do to honor his dad. Or he believes his, or, or some people believe his dad was just about to die. So he just wants to spend the last couple of days with his dad and then give him a proper burial, then he'll come. And Jesus says, leave the dead to bury their own dead. As for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. I remember the moment I got a call when my dad, best friend in my life, had passed away unexpectedly from a heart attack. Like, I can't imagine hearing those words in those moments. I leave, let somebody else do the funeral. You have more important things to do. So that's why I say I pray that the proclamation of Jesus' kingdom will be the priority in all your plans and dreams, basically what 
the Bible is teaching us here is that there is a priority, if I could use the word, an urgency to the proclamation of Jesus' kingdom that supersedes everything else. Like we are here on this earth for the proclamation of Jesus' kingdom. It's just, it's just so important, right? When there's people in the world who for the last 2,000 years have never even heard the good news of the kingdom, why is that? Because we're apparently not prioritizing the proclamation of his kingdom. Like the, it, would no, it would not be possible if there was, if the church, if we as followers of Christ were prioritizing the proclamation of Jesus' kingdom to the ends of the earth, then there would not be two billion people in the world today who have little to no knowledge of the gospel. So I pray that this will be the priority in all your plans and dreams. So as you think about your life, to see the grace God has given you, the unique grace that God has given you for the proclamation of his kingdom. So you go over to those mountains and there's all kinds of people that you meet who, who have this priority. I meet teachers who could be teaching anywhere in the world, but they've moved to teach in those villages for the proclamation of Jesus' kingdom there. Medical nurses who've moved up into those mountains, working in health outposts for the proclamation of Jesus' kingdom. I think about one guy, uh, Ben. Uh, he's an aquaponics expert. You know what aquaponics is? It like deals with trout poop and waste. I, I can't really explain it. He can, with zeal, uh, explain how you can take trout poop and turn it into fruitful agriculture for people who are in need using PVC pipes and all kinds of other things. Like it's, it's crazy the way it works, actually bamboo. But anyway, I'm getting into details that I shouldn't be getting into. The, the beauty is though, I'm sitting there listening to Ben, I'm like, yeah, I, I didn't get this in seminary. Uh, I didn't get this in college, but that's the beauty. Like he didn't go to seminary. He has skills in aquaponics and he's using these skills for the proclamation of Jesus' kingdom to the ends of the earth. And so I just ask you the question, like, what, are the, what are the skills God has given you? What are the unique uh, grace gifts God's given you? The education you're getting now. I was talking with a, uh, one student yesterday in engineering and just saying, okay, I see the need in the world, so maybe I just need, almost like, should I just forget about engineering, forget about school here and just go be a part of that? It's like, no, like use engineering to open up doors for the proclamation of Jesus' kingdom in the world. I think, about, I think about one nurse. She finishes nursing school. She starts looking for a job. She strategically looks for a job in a part of the world where there is no gospel access. She goes and moves into the Middle East, now works in a hospital right in the heart of the Middle East. She's risen up in the ranks of that hospital in the Middle East. She's now head over nursing over that hospital in this significant city in the Middle East. She's head over nursing. She had a Bible study every week in her office with Muslims and nobody stops her. Do you know why? because she's really good at nursing. I, I wanna exhort you to excel in all the grace that God has given you for the spread of his kingdom and his glory to the ends of the earth. To see, like, what if God has designed the globalization of today's marketplace for the spread of his glory to the ends of the earth? The degrees you are getting here open up all kinds of doors for the proclamation of Jesus' kingdom in the world. So may this be your priority then. See your degree through this lens. As you think about your plans, your dreams, as you think about marriage, don't marry somebody whose heart doesn't beat for the spread of the gospel to the ends of the earth. I prioritize the proclamation of Jesus' kingdom and your plans, your dreams for your life. This is the most important thing. Like there's people right now, more bodies are being put on funeral pyres in the Himalayas. They need our campus filled with urgent priority on the proclamation of Jesus' kingdom. So I, I pray that it would be so. Finally, third, I pray, I pray that you will love Jesus more than your own life. I pray that you will love Jesus more than your own life. This last guy says, let me just say farewell to those at my home. 
I just want to go back and say to, goodbye to mom and dad. Brothers, sisters, Jesus says, no one who puts his hand on the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. In other words, when you follow Jesus, there is a superior affection here that supersedes all of their other affections. And that's, I think, the heart of the issue. Like when I go into these mountains and meet those who have followed Jesus, I think about one couple that chose to follow Jesus knowing it would be costly for them. They were immediately ostracized in their village. They couldn't use the water source. I mean, you depend on community for so much. They're totally ostracized from that community. One day they were out working in the fields and word came back to their daughter who I was talking with that a landslide had come and killed their parents, killed her parents. And the village leaders said, this is, this is because they started believing in Jesus. Don't believe in Jesus. It's this is bad things will happen to you. Their daughter later came to find out that a landslide did not kill her parents. Village leaders had actually stoned her parents, made up this story. And to this day in that village, people, when they hear about Jesus, will say, oh, don't believe in him. Remember what happened with the landslide. Here's a couple who love Jesus more than their own lives. Our daughter, who now loves Jesus more than her own life. So I just wanna invite us to join with them in seeing Jesus as more precious than life itself. Like to live as Christ, to die as gain. And when that is your perspective on life, when you realize that by the power of the gospel, the very worst thing that could happen to you, death, has actually been turned into the best thing that could happen to you, eternal life with Jesus, then you are free to live very different from the rest of this world. You are free to live with love for him and love for others, laying down your life for that which matters most in eternity. Discover who you're called to be at Biola University, a leading Christ-centered university in Los Angeles, with programs on campus and online. Subscribe for more of our videos and learn more at biola.edu.